If my girlfriend from the third world is a prostitute, how do I know if she really cares about me and doesn't view me as her work? That's from Nick. Uh, the backstory is I live uh, in Cambodia. I've lived here for four years. I've been with the same girl since moving here. Uh, I found her uh, at a club. Uh, she's relatively poor. She's uneducated. Um, she doesn't really want to get another job because uh, she gets quite a large amount of money from uh, older Western men, and right. uh, that's pretty much the pretty much the crust of it. Uh, I, this country is very conservative. Uh, I can't really date a let's say a non prostitute uh, in this country. Uh, there's I don't really know of anybody that's dating a woman in this country that is not one. So that's kind of the background. So basically my question is, is uh, does she have the ability to separate me from her line of work? And uh, you know, that, that's kind of where it's at. Right. Um, uh, sorry, which, which um, Cambodia, which uh, country were you in? Yes, I'm in Cambodia. And what are you doing in Cambodia? I'm a project manager for a construction company. And how much longer do you think you'll be in Cambodia? Well, judging by the state of affairs in America, uh, I, I, I do plan on staying here for, uh, for quite some time until I see some type of improvement. I uh, make a very nice salary. I'm considered upper middle class, which is very nice. Uh, the taxes are extremely low. And there's a lot of civil liberties here, which are very nice. The people are, are uh, the, the Khmer people are very, very nice and generous, uh, and they don't seem to uh, bother me or anything like that. So uh, that's that's pretty much that. So for the foreseeable future, right? Correct. <clears throat> now, when you met your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Did you meet her because you were visiting a prostitute or did you meet her? You said you met her in a club. Was there money exchanging hands at the beginning or has that not been part of the equation? No, uh, she, she didn't ask for it, but uh, out of uh, generosity, I did give her something. Uh, she never asked for anything for about the first six to seven months. And then, you know, uh, there's a safe face culture here where they, it's constantly lying. Uh, you know, and I knew I knew of this prior. Uh, you know, getting getting involved with her, and uh, you know, she kind of told me what it is she do she did, and I I kind of had an idea, but I kind of just looked the other way, and uh, that's that's pretty much how it's uh, been since. So she's still working as a prostitute. Correct. And how do you feel about that, Nick? Uh, I've become very um, unempathetic towards it. Uh, I just uh, I try not to care. Um, I do a pretty good job at not caring. Uh, you know the you know as you know women whatever the country is the more you care the more you tend to push women away. That's personally from my experience, whether it be in America or, or living overseas. Uh, so I kind of just let it be. I let her go do what she has to do. Uh, and then she just comes back and it's pretty much normal when she comes back. And how many clients does she see a week? Oh, no, very few. Uh, she maybe, uh, uh, maybe one once every week or two weeks, uh, since she's been with me, she's, uh, it's been a, a much bigger decline, but, uh, her clients do give her for the few clients she does have, the money is uh, very large. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're getting five, six hundred dollars, uh, you know, from from an older gentleman, uh, that beats working, uh, you know, six days a week uh, for one hundred and fifty dollars a a month. You know. Well, I mean, okay. I mean, you can make money as a prostitute. I, I think that's not in doubt. But the idea that the only consideration when it comes to prostitution, the only consideration is how much money you're making. You know, I think it could be argued that there are other considerations involved in bringing a prostitute other than how much money. 
Right. Well, it's it, again in this part, this region of the world, it's uh, as you put it, uh, resources for eggs, uh, and that is very upfront in this part of the of the country. I mean, in in this part of the world, it's uh, not what you can do for me tomorrow. It's not what you did for me yesterday. It's what can you do for me right now at this moment? And I kind of refuse to give her, uh, let's say. Uh, like an, an allowance. I mean, I'll take her out here and there. I uh, bought her family a cow recently. I do things like that, but there's no. I'm sorry, you bought her family a cow? Yeah, I bought I bought her a cow. Uh, I'm trying to save up for a water buffalo. That's that. You, you know, you know, you know. There's an old saying: "Why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free?" You right. actually bought the cow, and now you're thinking of buying a water buffalo for the woman's family. Yeah, I also had them just for my own amusement. I, I mean, coming from New York, uh, I'm fascinated with farm animals. It, you know, it's something that I never got to see growing up. So if I get, you know, if I have a cow and a, ch a couple chickens, I'm kind of amused. And also takes care of our family because, uh, again, the, it's family comes first. Uh, if I was to marry a local in this country, I will always be treated as like second class. The family will always come first. And I will get treated as a, uh, you know, as behind. So I have to provide. If I was to marry her or marry any woman, uh, any Cambodian woman, I would have to provide for her family, uh, even if uh, her family are deadbeats or can't handle money. You know, they they are very, uh, they're not uh, responsible when it comes to finances because they are poor and whatever money. Uh, let's just say I give her five dollars, and that's what she has for the day. She'll spend it all within the first fifteen twenty minutes. So it, that is a, a major problem because it's they live day to day; they don't see tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, and it certainly is tougher to spend a cow because you know they don't fit in a wallet or anything. How much did the cow cost? Just out of curiosity. Uh, about three hundred dollars, but it was a an old. It's, it was an older older cow, like a. a Middle-aged cow. If, if I bought a young one, it'd be a little. It would be much more expensive. So I bought one that was, I guess, I don't know, she a fifteen-year-old cow. Right, and an older model. And how much is the water buffalo going to be? Uh, that's more. That's about five hundred to to almost a thousand, depending on how healthy it is. And uh, they would use the water buffalo for agriculture, is that right? I mean, they don't give milk or anything, right? Correct. And if it does have uh, uh, calves, uh, the calves are worth uh, uh, a great deal of money. There seems to be a high demand for water buffaloes right now. Sure. Sure. No, I get it. Um, but I guess you'd have to buy two water buffalo if you want to have calves, right? Well, they, they uh, someone in the village would have the mate and they'd split the, uh, you know, the, the expenses and everything like that. You know, if they have a baby, they would go 50-50 or something like that. And what was it that drew you to the woman in the first place? Uh, well, I came here as a tourist back in 2011 and uh, she was a prostitute when I met her then. And uh, she asked for too much money, and I took her friend instead. And I came back about a year and a half later, and I saw her, and she remembered me, uh, kind of stiffing her. She goes, "Yeah, you're the one that uh, didn't want to take me because I wanted too much money." I go, "Wow, you actually, you actually remember me? Uh, do you want to like go have dinner? Do you want to hang out or something?" And she, she agreed, and you know, she, her English is really good. She's a she's a very uh, caring person. She's not nasty in any way. Um, she's also getting uh, uh, she's older than me. She's two years older, uh, and also, you know, she she wants to get married and everything like that. But I am very apprehensive about marrying someone outside my own race and my, outside my own country and things like that. You know, or, or who say is a prostitute? Oh, correct that also. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to check. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so you went with her friend the first time. So you paid her friend for sex the first time, right? Yes. And how much was that? Uh, it, not a lot of money. I, for, for Cambodia, it would be uh, a, a significant amount. But for a foreigner, it's very low. Well, what are we talking uh, I don't want to say because I don't want more guys from Western countries making their way over here. There's already too many of them driving up the, the prices. <laughs> what? You know, if it's $300 for a cow, 
Is it about a quarter of a cow? Yeah, about that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's some subsection of a cow to go with the prostitute. Now, is that full intercourse bareback? Is that oral? What are we talking here? No, I, I, would, I would wear protection and everything, of course. Of course, yeah. Yeah. All right. And um, so what do you guys chat about? Oh, well, we, we kind of know each other well. She she's a, she started listening. She actually listens to your show. Uh, I usually fall asleep listening to your YouTube channel or, I don't know, some conservative talk radio show, and she over listens to it. And, you know, she's uh, now fascinated with uh, uh, radical Islam uh, because she grew up in a village where there were a lot of Muslims, and she shared a lot of stories about growing up with them and what they used to do. Uh, and talking about what's going on around the city, uh, asking about her family. I, I, I tend to have decent conversations with her. She's not really, you know, up my ass, so to speak, about conversations and stuff. We'll talk for, for a little while, then she'll go, uh, you know, watch a movie or something like that. Or, uh, you know, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't bother me in that sense. She doesn't really need my attention like a, a Western woman would need. And uh, her family knows what she does? Uh, I'm going to say her mother does, but she tells me they don't know. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite, I'm fairly certain the mother certainly does know. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't get cows for nothing, right? I mean, and if there's a water buffalo waiting in the wings, that's not because she's a great conversationalist necessarily, right? Right. Well, the other thing is that she has uh, eight other siblings, and they're all married off already, and she's the last one not to get married. So the one that is not married has to provide for the rest of the family, and that's kind of a rule, uh, a, a rule in this country. Right, right. Do they so, – so they don't want her to get married unless she gets married to a man who can provide for the family because that's her job, right, to either provide for the family or to marry a man who can do that. Right, and they know that I'm a, you know, a, a Caucasian male and in this country there is a lot of racism. So if you have a Western boyfriend, that automatically means I have money shooting out of my ass. Right, Okay. So it's pro-white racism, is that right? Yeah, so if I go to the market, I would get charged double the price, but I speak the language fairly well, and uh, since I do speak it when I go to the market, they kind of know that I, I live here, and they'll lower the price, but it's a constant hassle when trying to shop and do things that, you know, whatever the price they're telling you, it's double, it's automatically double. Yeah, I mean they'll they'll charge what the market can bear, and um, yeah, that makes sense. Right. Just out of curiosity, I've never been to Cambodia, but uh, is there any residual or leftover resentment towards Americans from the spillover from the Vietnam War? None whatsoever. The uh, the Khmer people absolutely vehemently hate uh, Vietnam, and uh, as long as it's killing uh, Vietnamese, they are quite okay with it. Right. Okay. There's and a lot, there's a lot of there no sorry there's go a ahead. Lot of hatred between the two countries uh, to this day because of many different reasons. Big big right. cultural difference between the two. Very very large. It's like comparing Canada to Somalia. Okay. I uh, I will accept that. And are there any western or white women out there who you might be in contact with or be interested in dating? Uh, there, there are more and more uh, Western women coming here now. Uh, the rapid move, move towards globalization uh, is definitely... Well, it's, it's you people setting up the free cow economy. It's drawing all of the Westerners in because, you know, where there are, as you know, the old saying, where there are the free cows and possibly the free water buffalo, there shall ye find the ladies. Uh, yeah, the, the Western women here, uh, I, I'm going to say they're pretty much the same as like in America uh, or, or in Europe. They just appear very asexual and not really don't seem to want relationships with guys, so to speak. Or they'll just have keep having sex with the same guys over and over, you know, like the bartender or the, you know, the has been rock and roll guy kind of a thing, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Flat Earth masseuse. So, um, so the Western women who are out there are not 
women that you would particularly like to date? No, social justice warriors, NGO types, UN workers, uh, the expat community here is very small. It, it's a very small market in general, this country. It's it's still relatively poor, so it's there's not a big uh, international community here yet. Uh, there's only a handful of Americans. Most of the foreigners here are Australian, British, and French. Um, so the uh, Western women here, you know, uh, my neighbor, she's from uh, Wisconsin. She invited me to do to go do the play, the vagina monologues, and I just wanted to throw up in my mouth. And I'm like, absolutely not. I have no desire to do or watch the play vagina monologues. <clears throat> so what you're saying is that in the Western paradigm, a woman who is a lefty or a social justice warrior or has been infected perhaps with more radical feminism mm -hmm. has lower status lower sexual market value for you than a prostitute well well what what's it's not better? a criticism i'm just i'm just curious where your yardstick is well what's better uh, a 20 year old slender uh woman who's uh who, who will take very good care of you and kind of let you be and do what you have to do to a certain degree I, you know there's a lot of uh issues with dating a kamai woman but the uh again the western women here are very um Combative. Uh, I had a date with a 38-year-old 38, 38 woman. Uh, she, I'm 28, by the way. Uh, she's 10 years older than me, and she was trying to just prove herself to me in in like an aggressive manner that I can do this and I can do that, and you know, uh, just trying to outsmart me and try to uh, top me in some way, and I that kind of just really turned me off. Uh, as compared with the uh, a Kamai girl, they're much more traditional. Um, they're very sweet. They're very kind. They smile. They laugh. If you're uh, one thing I really do like about the women in this country is uh, if you're handsome, they will actually smile and joke around with you, and they like being they like being they like catcalling a little bit, you know, in a respectful manner. And you know they they they're pretty playful. They're very nice people. As compared to a Western woman, I can't really do any of that. Whether it's in New York or or here, they just again they don't seem very interested in relationships with guys. Okay, so the sexual dimorphism or the women being the women, and the men being the men is something you find more compatible with this woman, right? Correct. All right. So your question is, is there any way to know whether she's into you for something other than your money? Uh, well, I, I know she is to a point. Uh, obviously, she is because, again, I don't, I don't really take uh, – uh, financially, I don't really take that good care of her as compared to, like, her friends that uh, have Western boyfriends. But, again, these Western boyfriends are much older. They're 50, 60, 70 years old, and I'm 28 years old, so I cannot give her – like a thousand dollars a month that these guys that are uh, in their twilight years trying to rekindle their their youth, so to speak, you know. Right. Well, I mean, you know, the answer, I'm sure, as well as everyone who's listening to this, which is that if you want to know if she's into you without the money, you stop giving her money. You know, right. if, if you want to know if people like you for you or, or your money, you stop giving the money. And if they I, still like you, then then, you know. This brings up to the fact that this is something I really would like to to mention, and maybe you could maybe you can share what is really the sense of marriage if they all they're gonna do is somewhat just bleed you dry at the end, like uh, most Western guys that are your age that I know who warn me not to get married. I mean, all the mentors uh, in my life. Uh, well, no, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's a separate issue. Your question about whether she's into you without your money, you can solve by not giving her money and seeing if she's still into you, right? Well, she is, but she's now not. We can get on to the other topic if you want, but but that's that's the first one. Right. Well, the, the, she's still around. I honestly don't really give her much. It's just, uh, you know, just out of care and, you know, like just it makes me it also makes me feel good to be able to provide for her in some way, you know. But there's no residual effect if I do something nice for her. For example, if I was seriously contemplating buying her her own little motorcycle, 
But uh, most of my Western friends here said, absolutely, absolutely not. Do not do that because she will just sell the motorcycle and then blow the money in some other way, whether she'll wind up giving half of it to her mother, the other half to maybe going out with her friends or something like that. And, you know, just being irresponsible with the money. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, because here's the thing, right? I mean, the idea, you want to give resources to women. Right. Yeah. Women are the gravity well and resources are the star matter and we're the unstable gas giants. And and basically women pull resources out of men. And and there's right. nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly natural and it's perfectly valid. It's how we've evolved. Right. That women are giant resource holes and they they are that way because they have kids and they breastfeed and they need lots of resources. So once a man gets into a family situation, he has to spend, you know, five to ten times what he would spend if he was single, with the plus coming out of it that he gets an entire giant family to to nurture and and succor him and, and um, com give him companionship into his old age. And he continues the race and he creates life and, you know, it's a, it's a good deal all around. Mm -hmm. So when you're around a woman, particularly if you either want to sleep with her or are sleeping with her, you will want to give her resources. Uh, that is natural uh, for, for men to feel. It's one of the great powers that uh, women have. And um, it's, again, it's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, well, keep combined with the state, it's a bad thing. But ketchup combined with the state turns into blood, right? So, so the fact that you want to give her resources is perfectly natural. The fact that she wants to take resources and that there is a sexual element in the transaction is, again, not wildly outside of nature. Mm -hmm. But you're in this weird situation where you have marital economic relationships with no marriage and no prospect of kids, right? Because now that women have uh, access to birth control or men have access to pretty reliable birth control, mm -hmm. a weird thing has happened. You know, you weren't, we're not supposed to buy sex for very long, right? I mean, if you sort of think about it in the past, women did not put out before marriage. And so you would have to marry the woman and you'd go on, on your honeymoon. And for the couple of days to week or two that you'd be on your honeymoon, you'd have sex seven times a day or whatever, right? Yes. And then she'd be pregnant, right? So your, your big financial sex, it's like it would last like a, a week or two. <laughs> That's it, right? But now, of course, you can get involved into this Groundhog Day of infinite resource vampirism where you're sort of giving resources in exchange for sex without the inevitable, oh, I missed my period. Oh, I'm pregnant. Oh, here's some babies, right? Right. And so we're kind of stuck in this perpetual honeymoon situation. Um, and by the way, the reason it's called a honeymoon is because it starts off sweet and you end up kind of sad at the end of it for right. reasons of hedonistic excess or whatever it is. Anyway, so that situation that you're in is sort of like the perpetual adolescence that young people in the West are now stuck in, these groundhog days of perpetual schooling and living at home and, and being in debt and not having resources and postponing adulthood and careers and commitments and all that kind of stuff. So you're kind of in this null zone, which is really only supposed to last a short amount of time, is only supposed to occur after a lifelong commitment and is like eight minutes before children come squirting out of your wife's hoo-hoo, right? So that is kind of a weird situation to be in, evolutionarily speaking, if that makes sense. Yes, that does make that does make sense. The the other thing though is like if I do give her, let's say, let's say I give her fifty dollars, her response would be, Oh, just fifty dollars, that's not a lot of money. And no matter what I would give her financially, she would always say, oh, that's not a lot of money. So it could be a thousand. She'd say, oh, that's not a lot of money. It could be twenty dollars. Oh, that's not a lot of money. So no matter what I do or whatever I provide for her, it's never going to be enough. And, you know, I can I can say that about my my parents relationship where my parents have been divorced 10 years and my mother makes uh, double what my father makes in salary and and my father doesn't have to give her anything but my mother still harasses my father for financial support you see so it's never it's this constant loop of uh never being satisfied or never being happy with what you give them sure i mean but that's you know women are not satisfied with the resources they receive of course not right. i don't know maybe melania trump with her gold-plated um 
bathware or whatever. <laughs> Maybe she's satisfied. But yeah, of course. But so what? I mean, men are never I – mean, is your computer ever fast enough? Is your cell phone ever cool enough? I mean, we all want more. There's nothing particularly wrong with that. Right. Um, it, it is a little troubling. I mean, of, of all the things that are troubling about this, it's a little bit troubling, Nick, that there doesn't seem to be a lot of thanks. No, there is absolutely no thanks, and that is with uh, the vast majority of the women in this part of the world. There is no, like, uh, the joke is, or wife credit or girlfriend credit. Like, say, you know, I took her to uh, Thailand for a, you know, for a week. We had a great time. Uh, as soon as we got back, I wanted to go see my friends because I haven't seen them. And then she just started, you know, screaming and yelling that I don't care about her after I just took her on a... A uh, very nice holiday. So there's none of that uh, residual effect showing that I care. So it's constant. What are you doing for me at this moment? Not what you did for me before, and not what you're going to do for me tomorrow. Right. Is that a- and okay. sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm saying, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And do you think you would ever marry her? Uh, well, she's been the longest girlfriend I've had since uh, my early 20s. Uh, you know, she by far, as far as intercourse goes, she's been, you know, the girl I've had sex with the most in my life. Uh, she, rep, you know, she's, uh, she knows how to present herself very well. If most people were to meet her, they would never think she was a prostitute at all. So all those things I do like a lot about her. Um, and, you know, she, she, she's a good woman. But again, you know, she's financially irresponsible. Uh, she's never really worked. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to say prostitution is not a job. But, you know, if she had the choice between working in a garment factory or, you know, going on a vacation with some old guy who's really not going to do much to her but just throw money at her, you know, you can't really blame, blame her for doing what she does. And Nick, what was your um, what were your mother, uh, what was your mother and father's relationship like when you were growing up? Uh, fine. Uh, my mother was ten years older than my father. Uh, by the time my father turned 45, 46, he wanted to go to Manhattan, go see plays, and do these other all these you know trying to relive a little bit, you know, taking up different hobbies. And my mother was 56 and she didn't really want to do any of those type of things. She just wanted to, you know, stay home and, you know, watch uh, foreign flicks and subtitle movies and things like that. So. And why did they get divorced? Uh, I think, again, I think my my father went through a midlife crisis. Uh, My mother wanted a change for, for whatever in particular reason. Uh, you know, uh, and then my father met uh, my stepmother, who is a little bit younger and attractive, and he, he and she has, uh, she's financially well off. So my father saw that, and he uh, jumped the uh, jumped the ship, so to speak. Yeah, it's not generally a midlife crisis; it's a no life crisis. Right. I mean, I was. I mean, it's a, you don't have a life. You haven't achieved your goals. You haven't fulfilled your dreams. You've been stuck with a stay at home. Uh, deadbeat and your life is it's not a midlife crisis because you know i went through the middle of my life didn't have a crisis it's a no life crisis where you realize you're not going to live forever and you better damn well get your living in before the grim reaper comes and uh, cuts off your head well they, they definitely the both of them definitely do regret getting a divorce now because they're both uh not as happy as they were when they were married i will say that and they still do love each other they, they talk every day i just got uh a call from my mother before taking up this phone call that my mother will uh, put the deed to the house to my father after my father uh, gave it to my mom. So they, they, they're, still, they're still friends and everything. So, you know, they're, they're fine. I had a very, very nice uh, uh, upbringing. I came from a very conservative Roman Catholic family. I'm a second generation Italian. So all those, all those nice things. I have all my cousins, all my grandparents around me all the time. I'm just, you know, forgive me for hopefully not being too much of a prude or a square, Mm -hmm. but how does a nice Italian Catholic boy end up going to Cambodia and paying for sex? Well, if you really want to know, and it's a topic for another day, uh, I I don't think you've ever mentioned it before, but I had a very nice job in uh, New York City. I was implementing sustainable development. Do you know what that is? 
I, I think I do, but I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. Uh, sustainable development uh, as far as a municipal uh, municipality planning was my job. I had a very nice salary. Um, I was making good money, but I actually come to the conclusion through uh, you know my job, what I was actually doing was kind of um, supplying the bricks to my own prison in New York, if that makes sense to you. I think it does, but tell me what you mean. Uh, well, sustainable sustainable development is a, a is a, a comprehensive plan on uh, uh, transit oriented development where they build uh, small cluster communities uh, close to railways and stuff like that. So, because they know in New York the property taxes are extremely extremely high, uh, they know that my generation and the younger generations will not be able uh, to afford. Uh, living on Long Island or in New York City. So it's a plan on how to uh, gradually uh, undermine property rights, so to speak. And when I saw this, I realized, wow, you know, if this is what my future is going to be, that I won't be able to get financially ahead and everything's just going to keep skyrocketing around me and I'm stuck at home living with my mom in the basement. Uh, I said, you know what, Let, you know, I'm young, I want to try traveling, I want to see the world. I had a friend here uh, growing up, he was living here being a journalist, he told me, why don't you come stay here with me, we can find you a job, and that's uh, pretty much it in a nutshell. Yeah, I appreciate that that's maybe why you left New York, I can't understand how you end up paying for sex in Cambodia though. Uh, well, I was a little bit ignorant moving here. I thought it'd be very easy to find a uh, a local woman to uh, to be my girlfriend. But the it's a very conservative society. It is marriage. It's uh, marriage to get sex. Uh, that it's either you're a prostitute or you're a virgin. There's no in between whatsoever in this country. It's a very morally uh, religious country. Right. And was this the first time that you paid for sex? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, when I came here as a tourist, yes. And how was that for you? Uh, uh, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't really mind it that much because the, the girls were very attractive. Um, they, uh, they carry themselves, uh, fairly well. They're your friends also, like, uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll keep in touch with you. You can, you know, talk to them, and, you know, again, because they're relatively my own age. So they're kind of comfortable with the fact that, you know, he's like, you know, he's our age. He's not some old creep, you know, on a holiday kind of a thing. Yeah. Could, could be thought of as a young creep, but all right. Right. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can go, not, not, not a wrinkly creep, but a relatively smooth skinned one. Um, so emotionally, it was not uh, something that you felt to be uh, a problem or humiliating or bad or anything like that. You just, you know, here's the money, uh, we'll have the sex, and we'll call it friendship? Yeah, uh, pretty much. I mean, I, I live here now, so I don't I don't engage in it uh, like I was on a holiday. I mean, I work here, you know, I have neighbors, so if I bring girls home, they're going to know something's up. And, uh, you know, I want to keep a, you know, a, a, at least have some self-respect and, you know, some decency, uh, you know, I don't want, you know, they, they watch you. like they Oh, dude, don't. I, I got to tell you, you know, I want to keep my self-respect while dating a prostitute. I'm not sure that those are wildly compatible goals. Right. Well, again, it, it's either, uh, you know, it's either what's better. Do I pay for sex or don't have sex at all? I, if I wanted to do that, I can go back to New York and uh, jerk off in the basement, you know. Right. Right. All right. Um, so do you date or go to prostitutes outside of your girlfriend? Uh, okay. Well, uh, because she is a prostitute, she knows all the other prostitutes. So as soon as I go and try to talk to one, they kind of radio central command up. Oh, he's over here right now. And then she calls me and says, what are you doing? I know where you are. You know, she, so she has that type of control over me that I can't really go and see other women because she, again. So you want to, but you can't get away with it. No. And she'll use that against me. And then, you know, when I bring up the fact, well, you do it, she, she will say, that's my job. That's different. Right. For you, it's more of a hobby or a calling, but for her, it's, you know, she's well, punching clocks. Well, right. Punching cocks, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. You get it now? Yeah, I, I think I do. 
<laughs> okay. So you're probably not going to marry the girl, right? You no, said you're always going to, right? Say, you're not going to, right? If, She's been a prostitute and, um, sorry, go ahead. If you were to ask me two years ago, I'd be, yeah, she's great. She's fantastic. But I guess I'm kind of, I'm just done with it. I definitely don't want to, you know, I don't want to see prostitutes or anything, but I'm, it's a bit of a catch 22 because, you know, again, here you're, you're because of the racism, they don't want to be seen with a foreigner because that would automatically, the society will automatically think the girl you're with is a prostitute. So there's a lot of that kind of a problem here. Right. So, I mean, where's the relationship going to go? Well, I want it to end, but I still enjoy having sex with her. And I haven't really found, <laughs> okay. yeah, I I understand. Haven't really found a, you know, uh, another catch, so to speak. Because again, the country, the society here kind of regulates white guy, prostitute, you, the better eggs are for the locals. Right. All right. Well, there you go. All right. Interesting. So, huh? I mean, you're, you're both a utility to each other, right? I mean, so fundamentally, if she was not able to give you sex, you wouldn't give her money, right? Correct. Right. So it is, um, she, she's using you as a cash cow, <laughs> almost literally, well, literally, I guess, a cash water buffalo. Right. And you're using her for sexuality. Correct. And you enjoy giving her money, and I would assume that to some degree she enjoys having sex with you, right? Uh, yeah, she enjoys having sex with me a lot. That's why she keeps me around. The the other thing is is she doesn't if uh, she doesn't want the thought of me going with another prostitute because that means I'm giving money to another girl. I'm not giving her that money. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. Yeah. I mean, she wants the monopoly of resources, and you want the monopoly of sexual access. But she's not willing to give you the monopoly of sexual access because you're not willing to pay her enough so that she won't go and see other clients, right? Right. So she, you know, she will try to get as much as she can from me to make sure I don't go out and go find uh, other girls. Right. All right. So since you're both using each other as utilities, I don't know why you're looking for more. Uh, well, I want to, I would like to get married. Uh, you know, I, 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 that is something I would like to do. Uh, you know, my family is, my mother at least is trying to push for it, but, uh, I kind of broke the news to my mother that it's not going to happen any, anytime soon. And the other issue is I moved here to get away from Western women, but the, you know, because of the cultural difference and things like that, I realized I can't marry a woman here. I would have to go back or try to find a Western girlfriend, and that is another obstacle that, you know, I'm. when I went back to New York, I went out drinking with my friends, and, and seeing everybody, I realized real quick why I left New York in the first place, was I wasn't really getting any satisfaction, regardless of me having a really nice job, a car, a nice home. It, the, the women are very uh, immature, I'd say most, most women under the age of 30 this day and age are very uh, narcissistic, uh, you know, between Facebook and Instagram and all these uh, type of things, uh, the vanity, they, uh, they, they're just not really on the table, especially a lot of them not on the table for marriage. But do you have a utility for her other than sex, fundamentally? I mean, I'm not saying you hate her or anything like that, but if she was an elderly Asian gentleman, would you be hanging out? Yeah, she. Uh, yeah, she. She's fine. Like I said, she. She speaks very good English. She cooks. She cleans. You know. She. she no, no, no. That's more. Hang on. That's more utility. Okay. Right. Just her as a person. Yeah, she's affectionate. She's. She's very affectionate. She's lovable. You know, we share some moments together. But like, you know, again, you know, if I were to show her a song, for instance, I go, oh, hey, look, this song reminds me of you. That would, she doesn't compute those type of things. So romance, uh, you know, sharing a moment like that is uh, very alien to her. Yeah. No, prostitutes, not, not very good at romance. I, well, I mean, I, good no, at faking it, I would imagine, I but not very just, good at the it, thing itself. I wouldn't say it's just prostitutes. It's, again, living in a third world country uh, that's, uh, that is Asian. 
Right. Okay. And she's half Chinese, so you know if you can, you know, understand a little bit more of that background. She's sorry. What? She's half. She's half Chinese. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So it's you know it's a little bit more. I wouldn't say she's aggressive, but uh, you know she she has that a little bit of that type of mentality. No, there's like th third world women have a hard edge to them because it's do or die, survivor or not. Right. I, mean, I, I get that. So, okay, hang on. Let me let me uh, let me ask you this: Do your parents know that you're dating a prostitute? Uh, I would say my father knows just by he just knows what it's like over here. You know, he goes, "Are you giving her money?" I go, I try telling him, "No, it's not really like that." He goes, "She's a prostitute," and I keep trying to reiterate, "No, it's a little bit different here." And he keeps saying, "No, she's a prostitute." Uh, so he, you know, he cracks jokes. Well, does she have sex for money? Yes. So okay, a, then she's a prostitute. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be totally blunt, but you know, the beginning of the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper names, right? But then, what's the difference between a Western woman cleaning your clock when you get divorced towards the end of your, you know, when you're in your 40s or 50s? You know, what's really? At least you're getting it up front. At least it's pay as you go. No, a Western woman cleaning your clock is not having sex with you for money. There is a little bit of a difference, right? Right, but at least it's a more pay as you go, not you know, you know, take that. No, out. listen, listen. I'm not, don't get me wrong, there's no initiation of force here. There's certainly an imbalance of economic opportunity, right? I mean, you're educated, you're you're verbally acute, you're a professional, and she's like, what, a village girl with no prospects, right? Yeah, I mean, she her, her she grew up uh, in bomb craters from the Vietnam War. That was her, you know, she used to collect scrap metal from uh, the bomb craters as a kid. Well, I guess Vietnam. Uh, on the border. She she grew up on the border. No, I thought, isn't she 30? She's 30, but no, the, the whole countryside is still littered in uh, in debris. Okay, but it wasn't during the actual war, right? No, she no, but her, in her, she, she grew okay. up, she grew up, she was a farm girl, her father. You might, you might want to check that birth certificate, That's just, yeah. <laughs> just if she's telling you. Oh, Vietnam was terrible. It's like, that was quite a lot of years ago, 40 years ago. Anyway. Yeah, well, there was, a, there was a civil war afterwards. They kind of came out of it maybe about 15, 20 years ago. Um, but she grew up on the border. Her father dropped dead uh, in the rice fields when he was 46 from just uh, exhaustion. Uh, after the father died, the mother squandered the land, lost everything, and now she like lives in a hut, you know, in another village. Right. Okay. Right. So I think that a, a, a relationship that's on such sort of power imbalance in that you have lots of options and she has very few options, uh, a relationship where there is cultural incompatibilities and a difference in history. I mean, you're educated. She's probably not very mm -hmm. educated. No. So there's a utility aspect. You know, she's um, your sex worker and you give her money. And again, I'm not saying that there's no affection or anything like that, but that's the foundation of the relationship. Now, if you want to turn it into something else, well, there's an old saying, you can't turn a whore into a housewife. Right. And this idea that we can have this, that you can have this sexual paid relationship, but turn her into a good wife and mom? Ah, uh, I think that might be a little bit optimistic. And, you know, I might want to listen to your father about this. Um, so as far as that goes, I, I think it's harmful for you in some ways. I mean, I'm, I don't want to tell you how to live, right? I mean, that's not, not my gig, but right. there are costs and benefits, right? You're not learning how to negotiate with an equal here because she's dependent upon you for money. There is something that – this is sort of the last thing that I'll sort of mention about this, which is um, there's a great song by Pete Townsend, uh, the guitarist for The Who – Mm -hmm. which he did on one of his solo albums. I'm not going to sing it for you, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of the lyrics uh, if, if that helps. And it's called Secondhand Love. And the lyrics are, Now you went out tonight. Who you been hanging around this time? I don't care if he's black or white. I just don't like his kind. He's been leaving his scent on you. I can sense it from a mile. All my money is spent on you, but you're still selling your smile. I can guess where you've been tonight. Yeah, you've been hanging out on the street, wearing your dress too tight, showing out to anyone you meet. 
I want the first call on your kiss. Answer me one question. Can you promise me this? I want my defenses laying in your hands. I don't want to rest in the palm of another man. I think there's a certain amount of dissociation that you have to be in to be in this kind of relationship. You know, you're going to smell another man on her. You're going to know that another man has been where you are in a very physically or biologically intimate way. And you kind of have to separate yourself from knowing where she was last night, knowing whose hands were on her last night, knowing who she was going down on or who she was having sex with last night. And I think that there's a basic kind of elemental male pride or possessiveness that you don't want sloppy seconds. You don't want the leftovers. You don't want secondhand stuff. Mm -hmm. And because you can't have a monogamous and exclusive relationship with this woman, I think it may be doing harm for you in the long run in terms of your capacity to commit. You hold all the cards and you have all the options and she doesn't. And she herself, of course, is not developing the kind of life skills that would make her a good companion into the future. She's not developing the kind of life skills that would make her a good mom into the future. So, I mean, to be honest, I think it's a little gross and tawdry, but that's just my particular perspective. You know, I'd like to think that if you're listening to this show, you can do better than paying somebody who is vastly below you in terms of opportunities for sex, but uh, that's just one possibility. So you're getting the sex. But my question is always when it comes to this kind of stuff, Nick, look at what it's costing you. Look at what you're not getting because you are getting this. And there will come a time in your life when sex is going to be less important to you. And you're going to look back and you're going to say, all the, all that time I spent paying this woman for sexual companionship, um, I don't have the sex anymore. I don't have the kids. I don't have the marriage. I don't have the love. I don't have the commitment. I don't have the family. I just have a whole bunch of flip uh, flip pages for the spank bank, and it kind of hollowed me out and didn't leave me with much to go forward on. So that's kind of all that I'd caution you uh, about as far as that goes. Now i got to move on to the next caller, but I do find it fascinating when I get the jaw-dropping calls, and I, you know maybe you've been out there so long that it doesn't feel jaw-dropping to you, but I certainly appreciate the, uh, the call-in. All right. Well, thank you. Keep up the great work. Thanks very much. Have a good one.